All right, <clears throat> we're on to the next um, agenda item, which is Pete Saronis, my friend. And it, truth be told, uh, back in December, I was listening to Pete's uh, webinars on his Dots and Bridges, and he had some DOE folks, and it was incredible. I am a big admirer of DOE now because of this, um, or those webinars that he does. And it gave me the idea of doing this summit. So I'm gonna hand it over to Pete Saronis of Dots and Bridges. Thank you, Tom, and um, I'm super excited to uh, have this opportunity. Uh, it was great working with you and the team, and we're super honored and excited to have this uh, next panel and, of course, uh, the two days. So, uh, Ann Duncan and Sylvia Burns and Vaughn Noga, uh, feel free to jump on screen. And uh, not that people don't already know who you are and what you look like. It's great to see you all in person. So, uh, Hey folks, um, we got 45 minutes and we have heard incredible factoids, uh, a little bit of bits, bites and insights from Kevin and Crystal. And it saved me quoting some of these awesome metrics that are in executive order 14057. And they did a wonderful job with context, but we hope that that was your kickstart and understanding that over the next two days, starting with this panel, you're gonna hear a little bit of that IT perspective, but bigger picture, you know, what's the impact on planet? What's the impact in our country? What's the impact on business? And Kevin brought up, you know, it's not so much about the cloud, but about the facilities. So as I prepare to uh, not embarrass or read the bios of our distinguished guests, I will say what's really cool too, is each of these individuals uh, represent three of our nation's most critical infrastructure sectors, energy, financial services, and water, wastewater, in addition to others. But of the 16, uh, you'll get a central theme there or a theme that is that uh, they lead agencies that have an incredibly powerful mission for all of our humanity. So without further ado, yes, I'm Pete Saronis. I had a good run in government and I've been enjoying my six and a half years out and, and being a connector, if you will, a storyteller, a translator, however you want to call it. That's what I do. I didn't retire, but boy, is it an honor to, to be here with, with Ann, Sylvia, and Vaughn. So Ann Duncan, you know her as the CIO of the United States Department of Energy. Did you know she has an MS and a BS in industrial engineering? She's a licensed professional engineer in California and Washington. And yes, she was a CIO in a former life at EPA. Yes, she understands what it's like to serve in the communities and the municipalities, the state, local level. Uh, she's got Silicon Valley in her veins. Big fan. Ann, it's great to see you. Great to see you, Pete. Thank you for that introduction. You got it. We're going to come back to you in a minute. Miss Sylvia Burns, uh, similar journey, Chief Information Officer, Chief Privacy Officer at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, former CIO at the United States Department of Interior. Again, uh, somebody who understands technology, the operations, and the impact on mission. And just think of the size of the agencies that Sylvia herself has led from a road mapping perspective. Bachelor of Arts in Geology, Master of Science in Business Management, and I love the fact that it's geology, Sylvia, because I have tons of friends in the National Energy Technology Lab in Albany, Oregon, who rocks and science are, are everything to them. So maybe we'll hit on that in a separate discussion. Great to see you. Thanks. Looking forward to this panel. All right. Hey, and, uh, you know, not saving you for last and, and, and not, uh, I thought the lady, in, the lady introduction was the way to go, Vaughn. Uh, Colleague, friend, uh, super humble, CIO, yes, at the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, but he's also the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Environmental Information. If you look at, if it, if you look at Vaughn or if you talk to Vaughn, he, he's humble, but he's all about IT in one sense and operations, just meeting mission. And that's what I love about uh, having worked with, Juan, with, with, with Vaughn in the past. Uh, Master of Arts in IT from Webster University, Bachelor of Science in Social Psychology from Park College. So kind of, this isn't a geek out session, folks. These are thought leaders, visionaries, and we're gonna talk about a lot of terms like environmental justice. We're gonna hit on resilient operations. We will address cloud, but make no mistake, our title is IT's role in achieving net zero emissions by 2050. I don't think anybody on this panel today or in the audience under, uh, will, will uh, disagree that IT is not the problem, but aligning IT and capabilities with the mission that's what we want to get at today and tomorrow. So let me kick it back to Anne. And I love to start out in this for Sylvia and Vaughn too. Spoiler alert, same question. Your journey, your passion, this topic, sustainability, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Can you just provide us with some opening remarks why this is such an important topic to you as a CIO, but as a human being? 
Pete, uh, thank you so much for asking about that. Um, you know, I will, I will do this by telling you a story. And that is that in 2013, uh, when I was interviewing for the job that Vaughn has now, um, they, I, I sat down with, uh, with then uh, Mr. McCarthy um, and Gina asked me, you know, why did I want this job? And I said, because uh, the environment and specifically climate change is the single most important thing uh, you know, that we have to worry about. It is the existential crisis of our time. Um, if we don't solve this problem, none of the other problems really matter, which is not to say they're not important problems, but if we don't figure out how to, how to live in this world in a way that we can create a sustainable future, that we can slow down climate change, um, that we can find ways to, to live in a somewhat climate change world, um, we are not gonna, gonna survive as a species. So it's a really big deal. Um, and as technologists, uh, we have our opportunity to help solve those problems in you know, what are a bunch of small ways, but hopefully if we all do our small thing, um, together we can make a big difference. I love the words existential crisis. That is uh, just something that speaks to me as a citizen in this country and one who uh, has the opportunity to see from a global and hear from a global perspective. Obviously, tomorrow when you have your tech talk, we'll get a picture of what's happening. And this is bigger than government, bigger than the United States. So thank you, Ann, for that. And, um, you know, super excited to have you. Sylvia, same question. Yeah, I love this question. So first of all, I'll tell you that I am a big um, geek around about sci-fi, love sci-fi. And if you guys remember, so like, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, all of it, right? Um, if you guys remember, not that long ago, there was this movie that came out with Ma Matthew McConaughey um, called Interstellar. And it was kind of, it reminds me of like, kind of like where I worry that we're headed, which is like the earth is in a terrible condition. and like a small group of people go out and they go into interstellar space. Well, so here's the thing. I love sci-fi, but I am a citizen of the earth. I, I will live and hopefully um, thrive and die here on the earth. And so I have to care about the earth. It's, it's, it's personal for me. Um, you know, to the point where my husband and I, um, we're doing so, we're doing as much as we can for ourselves to be, to like live net zero. Um, I kind of have talked to him about when we retire, how about we try to build a house and like live net zero. Um, anyway, an aspiration, a dream for retirement, but I kind of like just building off of what Anne says, if like, if we don't care and take each individually personal responsibility for what's happening, like what is gonna what's gonna happen? I don't want us to be like what happened in that movie, <laughs> Interstellar. Um, I want us to be like have generations of humans, right, on this earth, thriving and doing well and living in harmony with the earth. Um, so I, I take it personally, and I feel like um, I can't separate my personal self from my professional self because you know I bring the whole package. And so whatever, whatever I do, it's just like part of my values. Well, Sylvia, um, two questions or what, two comments. One, that's awesome. And I love the humanizing that you and Anne and I'm sure Vaughn will reflect and it's organic and I love it. So if you tuned in to hear a bunch of geeked out stuff, we'll get the cloud, we'll get to like decent tools. Maybe we get to like footprints folks, but these are our leaders in government. These are our chief information officers. These are folks that are, uh, as I like to think of it, the folks leading an agenda that while keeping lights on is part of it, they have a, a, a humanity side to why it all matters. So thank you, Sylvia. And then, and the second question is more than, more so than a comment. Is it Captain Kirk or, or Jean-Luc Picard? <laughs> oh, Jean-Luc. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, he, he, yeah. yeah, I mean, nothing against Kirk, but Picard <laughs> was the man. Okay. Um, Vaughn Noga, uh, question to you, buddy, floor is yours. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to be with this great panel. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, the best way to answer this question about sustainability is, is I, I found sustainability by leaving IT. And, and I left IT for about four years, about four years ago, and, and actually worked in uh, facilities, ran facilities for EPA, and my eyes are opened. I mean, sure, before, before I ran facilities for EPA, you know, we focused on things like buying Energy Star compliant um, equipment, and we made sure that the power savings were enabled on all IT across agency, and we checked the box. And 
And it wasn't until I moved to facilities to really understand the business side of the agency with respect to facilities, did sustainability really become forefront. Um, there were some aha moments, like traveling around the country. And, and at that time, we had about 130 locations. But some of our major locations, we had these huge file rooms filled with paper that you know, would take whole floors. And, and you start scratching your head like, wow, there's a, there's a lot of cost associated with not only the, the real estate and the real estate involved um, with, with setting this up, but when you build out a high density filing system, if you're above the first floor, you have to reinforce the floors, which adds additional cost to, to building out these facilities, right? And so there's aha moments like that and, and really looking at fleet management, right? We've got, you know, the EPA has got a large fleet and how are we managing fleet and how are we taking all this information and, and using that information to drive better informed decisions? And that was really kind of, you know, how, how I really embrace sustainability moving forward. And I think that's kind of what set me up um, in my role now as CIO of the EPA um, is really to, to look at and partner with the, the business side of the EPA to see how we can, can move the agency forward and be extremely sustainable at the same time, right? And that's, that's asking those, those, those what and let me help you questions and then really engaging the business side of the EPA. Wonderful. Uh, Vaughn, and, and I'm going to just echo a couple of things you mentioned, you know, but making better informed decisions, you know, the light bulb moment, aha moment, you call it uh, about facilities. Kevin hit on that, right? Underpinning all of what we do, what we eat, the air we breathe, the tr cars we, tr you know, we jump in every day, we depend and assume everything's going to work. And when something bad happens, to Sylvia's point, it's when we realize we're at risk. It could be the grid, it could be our water system. So again, folks, we're, we're, we're hoping on this panel to convey this, think beyond uh, if you sell into the government or if you buy, you know, it, it's not about the tech. It's what's the tech doing to solve certain problems that these individuals and their agencies represent. Okay, so a lot of this is going to be organic. We do have two questions. We're going to jump into that in a minute, but I always like to add a few uh, ancillary comments uh, that give folks context. And, and based on what Sylvia and Vaughn just mentioned, uh, Ruth Starr, I see you chiming in. I'm going to ask my guests this to feel like you aren't going to mess up with your mojo. Uh, there's some questions coming in on the Q&A. We will get to some of those. Ruth, that's a great question about, you know, CO2 levels and agriculture and recycling. Uh, we probably won't delve into that kind of depth, but it's awesome. And uh, again, I ask my guests, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and do that. Um, so um, the first question will come here and it's going to address data centers and balancing IT and, and data center management. But I want to echo one thing that I've heard so far today. This is a whole of government approach. I'm gonna quote some things from 14057. Everybody should read executive 14057 from December 8th of 2021. We wanna demonstrate how innovation and environmental stewardship can protect our planet. Shout out to Sylvia. Safeguarding our federal investments against the effects of climate change. Ann Duncan, awesome. Respond to the needs of all American communities, everybody, and expand American technologies, industries, and jobs. I heard that in you, Vaughn, and I think all of us, if you take those components, that's what this is about. It's not about IT, it's not about carbon footprint only, and it's not about tree hugging. It's about sustainable life and humanity moving forward. So please read that. And uh, if you hear the term environmental justice, there happens to be in 1992, an office of environmental justice. I know that's important to Anne uh, as well. Uh, go learn about that amazing entity that exists in government. So without further ado, and I have had some green tea today, but I would talk this fast anyway. Um, question one, Ann Duncan. Balancing data center management and mission transformation is a balancing act. How do you, as a leader, harmonize that compliance where you want to, say, take advantage of next generation technology in terms of modernization, which is always a theme in government, but also you've got a lot of legacy. How do you, how do you balance that? Uh, while it's attractive for that new cool tool, but also, hey, we have stuff running that cannot be ripped and replaced. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the whole modernization conversation, uh, you know, we could be here all day just talking about modernization and, and, and not even connected to sustainability. Um, so I think modernization, though, gives us a huge opportunity to be sustainable. So right, we can reach our compliance goals in terms of, you know, our, our guidelines for, for how we want to save energy, for how we want to reduce our data center footprint. You know, the really important point that Tom made about that though is, is all we're doing is putting that in someone else's data center. We're not actually getting rid of the data center. So we need to think about that too. But that modernization activities, if you're building um, <clears throat> a modern 
scalable cloud native application, right? By definition, you're going to be able to be more sustainable because if I can spin those servers up and spin them down as I need, right? I'm using less energy, right? If I can, if I have the ability to um, virtualize that, I'm going to use less energy. I'm going to be more sustainable. If I have the ability to pick that up from my data center and put it in a data center in a location where we can be more sustainable, that makes a difference too, right? So certain data centers, you know, if you look across, I honestly know EPA's data center portfolio burn DOEs right now because I was there. I was there longer than I've been at DOE so far. Um, but if you look at, at you know at EPA, they've got data centers in places like Seattle um, where they can use air side economizers and pull cold air in from the outside. Right, and that's much cheaper than if I'm running a data center, say in uh, in Dallas, right, where I have to worry about um, you know cooling 24/7, right. So there's thing, you know, so if I now have that virtualized application that doesn't need to be on my site, that can be in a cloud environment, and I can pick a cloud. Maybe it's one of my own sites, maybe it's a vendor site, but I can pick that up and put it in the cloud anywhere I want. Then that it means that I have that flexibility. So. You know, I can I can become more efficient. I can reduce my footprint, um, and I can modernize my applications and become more secure. All of which can contribute to sustainability at the same time. Love it, Sylvia. Saw a lot of nodding. You want to riff off some of that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat any. I agree 100 percent with everything with that Anne said, and I um, I'm I'm trying to follow suit with the things that she said. But I want to say that. Um, to her point, like I am extremely impressed, encouraged, and grateful by what I see happening in industry with the innovative approaches and ingenuity that they're applying to how to how to um, be better users of energy, like to invest in renewables. And um, that's not just, you just can't do it at the level that our agencies operate. We can't do it independently at our level. Like it, it, like I have, I have some, I have electric cars because like I'm really into it, right? And it's related to the sustainability thing. The rationale for why do I have an electric car is because when I plug in, then I, I'm, I'm getting my electricity from Dominion Energy, and they have the opportunity at their level to diversify their um, energy sources, and they are increasingly trying to get. Um, non-carbon based energy sources. I can't do that at my house, right? They can do that at scale. It's the same thing with the data centers. Um, for us to go to the cloud, I mean, the big data center providers, they can do this at scale um, and we benefit from that. And so, and that's just a byproduct because we get even more with going in that direction for our, for our mission and our businesses. Well, great, great point. And I'm already, I'm drawing pictures. When I look down, I'm like taking my own notes because I'm having my aha moments for what it's worth. And Vaughn, I'm sure you're going to go there. But two things, one thing that just came across from Sylvia and, and, and Anne is this, you know, we can meet compliance. We can absolutely say these are metrics we want to achieve, you know, high bar, low bar. But, you know, the cloud makes sense. It can do things 24 seven with this incredible influx of opportunity that as a service offers. And Anne and Sylvia, I both heard you echo that, that, you know, let's put the, the, uh, the, the responsibility to trusted partners so we can, you know, really get back to what are we trying to achieve beyond compliance? So I loved that. And we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into um, ways in which we can do that here in a minute. Vaughn, you know, what are your thoughts based on what our, our other guests, Anne and Sylvia have mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I, I could say ditto. Um, I, I think, and I would, I would take it to the next, to another level. At least, I think it's another level. You know, I, we always throw this term around IT modernization, and I'm not a big fan of that term because it means it means you've had an aha moment. Like I've got to do something instantaneously to modernize because it's gotten so old and so outdated. I'm not meeting my mission requirements, right? And so I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of continuous modernization because. It's a journey that we're all on and we're addressing it every day. Um, and, and I think relative to, you know, data center and, we, when we, and we've touched upon it, you know, back in the old days, you know, a couple of decades ago, we, we designed based on our, our anticipated peak requirements, right? So if we had a workload, we said, oh my gosh, we might have this much need for it. We filled a data center up with computers, right? That were severely underutilized 
And then in four or five years, we said, well, we've got to replace it all with a bunch of computers that were, again, severely unutilized for that one day where you had, you know, exceptional utilization because of some events. Um, you know, we had our aha moment several years ago um, with, uh, with an application here at the EPA. It's not just one application, but it was, it's kind of illustrative of, you know, our thinking process and how we're engaging the mission. It was a, the Air Now application. And it was during the time when we had the wildfires in California. And at that time, we still hosted that application at the EPA data center. And, and we couldn't scale, right? We were having issues with people being able to access the application. And there was an aha moment saying, you know what? Our workloads are scalable. And we need to make sure that we host them in an environment that is scalable and we don't have to make a significant infrastructure investment. And, and so when you start thinking in those terms, you start looking at, hey, how do I do that? And, and for those certain workloads, and I'm not saying every workload, but for those workloads, the aha moment is it makes sense to go to the cloud, right? We, we pivoted, we moved the application to the cloud. We're able to scale up, scale, scale down based on consumption or need, right? And that's really was the aha moment. And we've moved a lot of our workloads where we needed that scalability. And those are the ones that, that truly make sense um, and, and we've been, I think, fairly successful at that. Um, you know, if you look at another big application, EnviroFacts was moved off into the cloud because we have such a high utilization and it's cyclical, you know, based on when something is published and when, when new information is available, that's when we see the, the, the uh, unanticipated loads on those, those applications. So, you know, really the, the mission drives, you know, the direction and, and how we continue to modernize. Amazing. And I can't go to my next question because one just popped in my head and I promise it's a softball. And so I'm going to come to you first. Uh, so Vaughn, you hit on the theme of as a service. So I'm going to speak to anybody who sells into government right now or to somebody who buys from our industry partners. You're hearing people, and I've even expounded on this in my career, is it's about, you know, what capabilities do we need to support our mission. And it could be a mission that is, you know, a result of a natural disaster. Vaughn, you brought up, you know, being continuously improving, not just being reactive, right? Being proactive. And Sylvia, Vaughn, um, is there a shot or a shout out to industry? Because you brought it up, Sylvia, you know, the innovative approaches that you're seeing industry. What could industry, or maybe what can you offer to industry is when you, when they come talk to you or your colleagues, it's not about, right, here's what we do. We're a shiny penny or we're a bullet that can fix all your shiny, you shouldn't say bullets these days, but, but, but the solution. Um, shouldn't they be saying, you know, hey, I may not know what my product does yet, but, but I, I think there could be a mission or an opportunity that, that I can help you with and, and have that kind of a dialogue. I mean, what do you say to industry when they're trying to market to you versus, you know, them coming in thinking they already have a solution? Uh, so, Pete, I think, uh, you know, the number one point is that they that they need to do their homework and understand uh, our business and what what our challenges are and what we need to, uh, you know, need to accomplish. And and I think, you know, that's both harder and easier in government. But one of the things that's easier in government is that we can be relatively transparent in conversations like this about what we're doing and what what's happening and, you know, how to how we need help. Um, I think that uh, it's important that uh, vendors listen carefully because sometimes I will um, I will get uh, you know I'll, I'll do a talk and then I'll get a follow up uh, you know I had one recently where where I said you know we're looking to do X with our federal partners and I had a bunch of vendors say hey I want to come help you do X because you said you want help and I had very specifically said we're looking to do this with feds not with vendors in that particular case. So listen carefully, understand the need, have conversations uh, with folks in your organization to really put a value proposition together and then, and then come to our team with value proposition. And, and I will say this, which I think, you know, I tried to explain when I was on the other side to the folks I worked with, and I'll try and explain again. You, you really wanna enter the organization actually at the lowest possible level, not the highest possible level. Because the, in government, CIOs, don't make a lot of decisions about what to buy. CIO has set strategy and there are folks on their staff who have the job of figuring out how to do that. And they have a lot of autonomy and authority to figure out 
uh, within the parameters that exist for them, uh, what to buy and who to buy it from. Um, and you know, there's a whole procurement process behind that. Um, but you know, that's look for that actual decision maker and don't assume the decision maker is one of the three of us talking to you. It's people who work for us usually. I love it. Do homework, listen carefully, understand needs. Sylvia, a few comments on that. I'm sure you've been through this many times. I mean, times. yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it's very important for us in the government to have an ongoing dialogue with industry. Um, I know that um, the federal CIO Council, which Vaughn, Diane, and I are very involved in, right? Um, we, um, there's a partnership they have with an organization called ACT IAC, which brings together the government with, uh, you know, companies and industry to talk about whatever the latest thing is. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was working very heavily on zero trust architectures and trying to promote that in 2018. Um, and it was not it was not on industry's radar. And um, we had to get together with them. So we, we got together with people in ACT IACT and said, hey, this is a need. We have a need to go in a different direction because the old paradigm does not work for us. And we're going to need industry to, to innovate and actually find the technical solutions that we need because we're not gonna make them in the government. We're gonna buy them from industry. Um, so just to emphasize that Anne is exactly right, like them knowing what we need is important. Us communicating that is very important. The other thing, I think keeping that in mind, something that I really like about the cloud and um, the offerings that a SaaS or PaaS provider can, can give you is that they're doing what Vaughn said. They're doing continuous modernization because that is their business model. They could not survive if they were not continuing to innovate and think about what the future of, um, of what their offerings are going to be to us, um, us and other customers. So I like that because we just, we get the benefit of that, right? You don't have to, you don't have to opt in or out of stuff like that once you invest in, say, a software as a service or pass kind of solution, you just get whatever they, what is on their technology roadmap. So I think that that's a tremendous benefit for us. Um, and Anne is exactly right. Like we, we're defining strategy at our level. I, I know like um, a lot of vendors are trying to always chase us down. And the truth of the matter is, is that we, we don't get involved in, um, those like kind of like the acquisition process um, because we'd probably get ourselves in trouble and our agencies in trouble if we did. There's like a very defined process for all that to go down. Great feedback. Uh, Vaughn, any comment on that? Because I know you are very open and, and available, but you're busy. What are your thoughts? And <laughs> Just a couple, I, would, I would agree with everything Sylvia and Ann said with respect to, to technologies. And, and I tell folks all the time, there's other folks in the organization that that it's their job to to work with with industry and, and with the vendors to understand technologies. Um, I, I will say one of one of my messages to industry is, and especially with people who who are part of the team now, if you will, is you know bring us innovations. When I say innovations, you know my budget's not growing. I suspect Sylvia and Ann are probably in the same. You know the, our budgets are fairly static when you when it comes to IT. So we have to innovate from from with what we have. Right? We've got to create opportunities so we can improve our capabilities, right? And the only way to, to create, those, um, create those opportunities is for us to introduce innovations into technologies we deployed, you know, the embracing of cloud technologies, optimizing how we're, we're providing those services internally. And so we're really looking for that. And I know it, it's kind of counterintuitive because that may mean, hey, if I make it more affordable, I bring an innovation that reduces the cost, then I may be not benefiting from the revenue, right? And, and I think that's a, that's a tough conversation. I think folks need to understand is, you know, we need the opportunity to innovate so we can reinvest, so we can continue to innovate and provide new capabilities, not only our, our workforce, but to, to the citizens. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Great, great points all around. And, and you know, I, I, I... I heard the term mission and do homework. And, and of course, I think most folks know look, there's doing homework and then there's doing homework. You know, has anybody truly read executive order 14057 out there in industry? And if you had great, I'm going to give everybody a little cheat sheet here. And even to my colleagues, not on the call here, because I know you have, uh, but section 101, section 503 and section 102, not in that order. 
just read those in 14057. There's rich opportunity there that speaks to the themes that Ann, Sylvia, and Vaughn have talked about. Things like, you know, we have a once in a generation economic opportunity with sustainability. Okay, we have to advance environmental justice. We have to look at our, uh, the environmental effects on the underserved and unserved. We have to expand American technologies, industries, and jobs. Those are great storylines. If I, I heard my guests correctly say, align your capability to that and come in and let's have a conversation that, that may go somewhere or may not, but at least it'll be interesting. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw out there uh, sort of more of a tactical, hey, you don't always jump to the cloud, right? It's a journey. Um, data centers, as Kevin pointed out, you know, they are still physical folks. They're not something that is puffy as I look outside and say, ooh, I wonder, you know, if one's hanging out up there. Um, Data centers, uh, they are what they are. I consider them the most critical of all infrastructure. We have so much information coming in and going out and depending upon everything from power to you know, good data to protected data. Um, but before you make that journey or you start the journey, things like analyzing your infrastructure assets, trends and performances, uh, investing in, as Vaughn pointed out, standards-based, tried and true capabilities, and then third, um, you know, just conducting that necessary due diligence. We talked about partnering with companies. Uh, can each of you maybe just give some sense of, you know, I'm sure you're all in the throes of a cloud journey or have been. What, what, what's it been like as cloud smart or to cloud first, to cloud smart really um, enable this process to be more of a, a joy ride than a frustration? Um. I could start. Yeah, um, Sylvia, jump in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's shake it up. Also, it's not easy because change is never easy, right? But it doesn't mean that we don't have to do it, that we shouldn't do it. So you got to jump in and, and just do it. Um, I think the tricky thing is like that because we're all in the, you know, in the federal government, um, we all we all have very, maybe two robust portfolios of legacy IT. Um, you have to deal with the fact that you're living, you're going to live for a long time, probably in a bimodal environment where you have things that you're modernizing and you're moving to the cloud and are getting to the target state you want to be at while you're trying to keep and sustain your legacy systems going because the people who work in your organizations, they're living on those day to day. Um, moving from one to one place to the other, it's never easy. I think one of the things you want to do is if, if we can inspire the business to, as they're thinking about modernization and migration away from legacy to kind of a new way, um, that they're re really given the opportunity to rethink how they're doing their business. Um, because, you know, we don't do IT for IT's sake. We do IT because it serves the mission. We are all here for the mission. And sometimes I guess like, um, you know, what I have to deal with kind of like in my own organization is everybody wants to talk about the IT systems. And I'm like, hold off, hold off, wait, wait, what are you trying to do? You know, are you trying to do that better? Do you want to do that better? Um, so like incorporating even other more modern concepts like human centered design as, as you're talking with the business about, well, how could you do this thing different? How could the citizen be receiving this in a way that is, um, you know, uh, more po a positive, a better experience for them? Um, I think like you have to start the uh, start modernization kind of with that dialogue because it'll more like you likely land you in the right place versus just focusing on IT. I but, love it. Um, but it's complicated, right? Like change because change is hard. Yep. Yep. No, 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 no doubt. And, and I'm seeing Ann and, and, and Vaughn and I could tell Ann you're, you're like, let me get in there. Um, <laughs> a couple things though that, that I loved and just, you know, again, to set context, legacy and next gen, rethinking how business is conducted. What are you trying to do? If I'm industry, I'm like, you know, maybe those are the conversations we want to be having. And I love the incorporation of, I don't think that anybody knows a business process in the government better than the folks who work in the government. And it's great for industry to come in and say, here's how we're doing it. Government shouldn't be too quick to say, well, that's not how we do it. It might be, here's how we're doing it. How can that solution maybe retrofit with us and get back to the you know, human brain being um, valued versus like, what tech am I buying? So, Anne, what are some of your comments on, on, on Sylvia's? 
Yeah. So, so uh, thank you, Pete. And I just, I'm just, I just don't stand still. I was not, not dying to jump in when Sylvia was talking. Yeah, but, you, um, you like to jump in. I do. But uh, so I think, you know, I was thinking as we were talking, you have a really interesting sort of continuum of organizations here. You have, you know, Sylvia, who is, you know, her, a lot of their stuff is very much public facing, whether it's to industry or to the consumer. Vaughn has a real mix, right? He's got stuff that's public facing and he's got a lot of research and, and scientific computing. And you put Dewey at the end where there's very little public facing and lots and lots of research and scientific computing. So those result in sort of different looks at, at the work. I mean, we, while, while the, the stuff that Sylvia deals with around process are true everywhere, right? You should always be looking at your process, your business process, how you're getting things done. Um, a tremendous amount of our computing is, is research computing. Um, and, you know, we have, and one of the fascinating things to me is, you know, I kind of started, you know, I think I started out with this operational thought, you know, when I was at EPA and certainly here is, well, you know, we got supercomputers. They're, they're, you can't replace your supercomputer. And that's certainly true in many cases. We are going to continue to have supercomputers on premise. So when you look at what goes to the cloud, what stays on premise, how do you make those decisions? How do you, how do you change your, your way of doing business? Some of that supercomputing is going to stay on premise because you want so much computing power and so much data close to you. But we're actually having conversations with some of our labs who are saying, you know what, we're not going to replace that supercomputer with an on-premise supercomputer. We're actually going to do that work in the cloud now. And that to me is a, a massive change in the way you do business. And you have to, there's a lot of due diligence you have to do to make that decision going back to the due diligence comment, right? That means you have to look at what does it cost you? Because one of the big bugaboos for everybody about the cloud is you get your data up there and then you, you, know, you want to get it back. And, and, and not only is data transport expensive, but your vendors often going to charge you an egress fee to get that data out. You have a ton of scientific data. You've got to figure out, does that make sense to move all that data to the cloud? Can I support my research mission, moving all that data back and forth? Can I support the computing part of that? Can, they, can, they, can my vendor actually scale to the level I need? Um, but all those questions are worth asking to understand, should I continue to manage this huge data center on premise um, or should I be looking at the cloud? You know, the other interesting thing that, about that um, is the way that, that I've seen some of our labs managing their data centers. Um, they've made decisions, right? They don't run, you know, they look at that research computing and they don't run a big generator. They don't run lots and lots of UPS. They're like, okay, if we have a power failure, we're going to gracefully shut down our research. We are not going to keep that running all the time because the fact of the matter is, is research is hugely important to the competitiveness of the country, but research doesn't have to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year if you have a power outage. So it's a different kind of due diligence, a different kind of decision making to get you where you want to go uh, at that end of the portfolio versus, you know, I need to make sure that NNSAs uh, uh, business operations are working 24 seven because we have to, to manage the nuclear stockpile. So just wanted to point out that those decisions just happen on a huge continuum. Yeah, and Vaughn, I, I see the head nodding. Let me just say something that struck me and I think this is so critical. Sylvia mentioned it and did in so many ways. The word, now we're geeking out folks, if you haven't picked on that. We're talking a little cloud, we're talking about really the, the technologies needed, data transport. The cloud for all of its greatness and elasticity and scalability, and it may make sense. There's also the, the question, right? Is it, you know, is it on-prem? Is it off-prem? Is it hybrid? Um, data transport, Department of Energy, supercomputers. That if, if you're doing it by the bit and the byte, you know, that can get expensive. You know, you got to value. But the idea of supercompute in a cloud, I believe, is a no-brainer down the road, and it will happen. But right now, just the fact that it could be something for our research and development community to solve problems or financial markets, uh, I think is, is an art of the possible moment. So thank you, Ann, for that. Vaughn, what, what's your view? This is the mission is not the same from agency to agency, depending upon if it's research development, standard operations. What's your thought on this whole data transfer cloud migration? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we looked at for cloud migration, and it's one of the, the things that I challenged the team several years ago when I, when I came into this role was, you know, we've got to lower the barrier for our business to adopt cloud, right? And so how do we do that, right? It's one thing to say, hey, we've got cloud offering, but you still gotta go figure out everything. You gotta figure out and figure out how to do encryption and encryption in transit, and you've gotta have all your 853 controls and you, there, there's a lot of burden to, to getting authority to operate for a system. And so my charge to the team was, how do we lower the burden? 
right? So, you know, as we started venturing into cloud and offering cloud services, the goal was make it very simple and very easy for someone to get to the cloud. And, and a lot of that is reduce the churn out of getting to the cloud, right? And it's a lot of the administrative and some of the technical controls that folks have got to, they've got to, they've got to be mindful of. If that's just part of the offering, where we're taking care of those enterprise controls, you don't have to worry about those enterprise controls, you're inheriting those, right? If you work in this environment, it becomes very easy for someone to migrate a workload or to onboard a new application um, because we've lowered the barriers. So, so we're, we're reducing the barriers, we're do, reducing the associated costs because you know, for those business unit, units, if they've got to go through and they've got to pay for an ATO that, that, that looks at all those controls, there's a cost associated with that. Um, and for a lot of those, it's not an insignificant cost. Um, and then quite frankly, the time, right? We, we can onboard applications a lot quicker into a, a cloud-based environment than on-prem because you're not, you know, we're, we're not worrying about, hey, do I have enough hardware or, or storage on the floor? Do I, do I have enough connectivity? You know, is there enough bandwidth going out of the agency or out of the data center? Those things are removed from the equation and you can really focus on the mission side, the application. What is the benefit? Why are we doing this? So Vaughn, you hit on the word that everybody's wondering, why aren't they talking about security and cyber and protection? I think I will speak for my colleagues and say, uh, obviously that matters and how you do that. We hope you comply with things like, or take advantage of the cybersecurity framework, uh, do your near due diligence on protecting data and whatever asset that is. It doesn't always have to be an individual, right? And it could be a device. And I think that's where multi-factor authentication, all this great stuff. And you'll hear more about that later today. But Vaughn, I have to say, I caught the word security in what you said. And uh, having a chief data privacy officer, and and you've expressed it, security supreme, but there is no silver sword. Um, there is a way to mitigate risk. And I think, um, Vaughn, you've hit on that. So, okay, it's 11.07. We have parting shots coming up which is our guests sharing with you what they took away from today, what they want to leave you with. And we'll, we'll start with uh, Anne and Sylvia and then Vaughn uh, and giving you just 30 to 45 more seconds to think about that. I want to summarize what I heard in these, this dialogue around cloud. Um, you know, we talked about, do you know what you have, right? Enterprise Architecture 101. What, 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 are the people, the process and technologies. What do you have today? Where do you want to go tomorrow? And to Sylvia's point, it's not rip and replace. You're going to keep some legacy that you just got six months ago <laughs> and not view it as the old tech, but you're going to have to bridge that gap. I think we live in a world where it's quote unquote hybrid. Um, yes, cloud smart, all forwards, IT leaders, the op opportunity to examine the benefits of a cloud migration right? It's not that you must or mustn't anymore. It's, does it make sense? And do we keep it on-prem? Do we go off? So infrastructure management, you know, 24 by seven incident response. Vaughn, you mentioned application requirements, the ability to develop in a cloud or in a container and then use it on-prem, huge workload management. I heard these are the things industry that to me are those capabilities that what your tool does. And I don't want to hear that every industry partner says I can do all that. There's a reason the government's the largest purchaser of IT. They buy stuff. The key is you to help them integrate it. So that's my kind of parting shot summary. Okay. No, no, no uh, mystery here, Anne, whatever you want to say, and, and Vaughn and Sylvia, but uh, parting shot, what do you want to leave with this audience? And again, uh, we appreciate just your insights and vision. Yeah. So, uh, Pete, I think I'll go back to where we started, right? Uh, and, and say, so, um, you know, sustainability, is absolutely crucial. You know, we all want to keep living on this planet in, in a in a place where we can enjoy it and have it be habitable. And you know, I'm planning. I'd like to imagine my retirement will be will be you know I can go to the beach and it will be an experience that I will enjoy. Right. So so let we need to do our work. Um, and I think that that you know it's it's incredibly important for us to think about sustainability um, in the context that. Uh, you know, data centers uh, use a huge amount of, of, of electricity, of power in the world. Uh, you know, we can argue that some of the uses are bad uses, some of the uses are good uses. Um, <clears throat> debate all day whether we should be mining cryptocurrency and spending all that energy. But the reality is that data centers take up a huge amount of energy. So it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to reduce the energy footprint of our data centers while uh, delivering on our mission. Of, of providing great services to the public and great uh, 
research to the to the world. You know, so we, we do cutting edge research. We have provide services. Uh, you know, the, if you go across the government, you know, the, the mission is massive, as you know. Um, so we've got to do all those things, do them well, uh, but do them in a sustainable manner, reduce that utility footprint, uh, and also keep everything secure while we're doing it. Uh, so that we can uh, have, have make sure that the public has confidence in the services we provide. There you go. And eloquent as always. Sylvia, the floor is yours. Um, well, so first of all, it was so great to hear from Anne and Vaughn, because even though we are often together in meetings, we don't get to talk like this. And like, I don't get to hear what's like in their brains, what they're thinking, what they're feeling about stuff. So um, this panel was great from that perspective, just to hear what was on your guys' minds. And Pete, I thought that you really were terrific as our moderator here. So you brought high energy. So I appreciate that as well. The one thing I would say that I would wanna leave um, folks with is that um, I think we all have to do what we can. You know, um, what what what's your sphere of influence? You can definitely like be responsible for yourself. Um, and then beyond that, what can you do? And I think if if everybody did what was in their power to do, um, things could get better. So um, so I would just say that you know to really get on top of the big problem because this is huge, right? This problem is humongous. And I'm honestly scared because when I see the reports, it's like, we're not doing good. Um, and if everybody just changed their attitude and um, really took it personally and did what they could do, um, I think things could get better. So um, maybe just offering that to everybody who's listening. Sylvia, before I go to Vaughn, I just got to say one of my favorite lines is Maya Angelou's, it's not what you said, what you did, but how you made people feel. Uh, you made me feel really darn good right there. And I just want to thank you for that. And I mean that. I, it's just purely coming through my head. So you're amazing. And, and we loved having you. Vaughn, by the way, everybody, I forgot to mention in my intro to, to Vaughn, cool dude and awesome guy that is. He served our country. Vaughn, thank you for your service. Floor is yours for parting shots. And, and thanks to... Uh... To Sylvia and Anne, I think it's been a, a, a great, um, a great panel. Um, as far as you know, parting words, if you will, with respect to sustainability, I, I think it's it's something we have to do. It, it's 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 part of where we're evolving. So if you if I look at the inflection point, certainly for IT, we're kind of we're at that inflection point where we need to stop focusing on the stuff, which is which is the data center, the compute, the, the networks. I mean, that's important, but it's, it's not defining us. It's the information that's defining the future. And so if you look at federal resources as something that's finite, not infinite, then, then we have to be better about how we're actually um, fielding those resources. And, and, and to me, you know, we need to be, we need to adopt, you know, cloud smart, uh, cloud smart approach. We're do, certainly doing that BPA. We need to be better about how we're engaging uh, the, the mission side, certainly of all federal agencies. Um, and, and you know, as CIO, it's not just about the data center. It's not just about the, the, the network and the, in, the, in, the endpoint computing device. It's about all the other stuff, right? It's not the one or two things that's gonna, it's gonna help us to achieve the goals. It's about the million little things, right? It's, it's all those little things that we need to do collectively that's going to help us achieve um, the sustainability goals. It's about working with our partners in facilities. It's about, you know, how do we, how do we de deploy better building automation systems? How do we better manage fleets for utilization and consumption? How, it, it's, it's how we get involved. And I think that's the important role of the CIO is to get involved with, with all facets of, if our, of our respective agencies. My parting shot, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity again. And uh, you humanized yourselves, you humanized this discussion. You are clearly amazing individuals and thought leaders. Uh, I think one thing that I took away, which I love is my light bulb moment is the power of questions and answers and conversations. We need to do more of that. It takes a village, government, industry, academia. And if, if you don't believe me, I hope you heard what these folks said. So Vaughn and Sylvia, Big hugs. It was great. And uh, hopefully do it again soon. Thank you, Tom and everyone else.